Uh, my name is Dave Marr. I work for the Wilson Center for Humanities and Arts at the University of Georgia. Um, and we are uh, presenting this, um, this conversation today with, uh, with, with some artists from the Indigenous Photograph Collective. Um, we, uh, we are really indebted to the Institute uh, for Native American Studies here at the University of Georgia and the Georgia Museum of Art, which are our partners along with Indigenous Photograph in this event. Um, I want to very quickly uh, let you all know that, um, that uh, the, the panelists are going to talk for a while and they're, they're each gonna present uh, some of their work, and then they'll they'll uh, have some questions for each other, perhaps. And and at any time that that you would like in the audience to um, to enter a question for the panel uh, or any individual panelist, you are welcome to do that. Um, there's a Q and A feature, um, so just uh, click on that at the bottom of your screen, and you can enter your question. Um, the first person we're going to hear from is uh, my friend Leanne Howe. Um, Leanne is a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Um, she's a poet, an author, and a filmmaker, and she's a professor of English here at UGA. And she's also the director of the Institute of, Af of um, Native American Studies. Sorry. Um, Leanne, welcome, and thank you for uh, thank you for being here, and thank you for kicking this off. Oh, thank you so much, Dave. I'm I'm uh, delighted to be here. I want to welcome everyone, uh, Halito Chicanas. Uh, we are coming to you to uh, day from the historic indigenous lands of the Cherokee Nation and the Muscogee Creek Nation, um, and UGA is situated on those lands um, and we want to honor them um, in our conversations. You know, the art of sculpting the land in Native America has always been the purview of American Indians. Artists, storytellers, painters, sculptors, writers, and most profoundly Native and Indigenous photographers. I remember some of the first images I ever had seen of American Indians was at the Wooler Rock Museum uh, in Oklahoma. I was probably 10 years old and it made a huge impression on me uh, at the time and I've always returned to that image. Um, um, I was with my grandparents and yes, the photographs were romantic powwow photographs. Others were from family collections such as Indian cowboys at rodeos and some were of my great great grandfather shoeing a horse. So natives have changed, developed, our art has grown and for that reason I'm honored to be sitting on this incredible panel of artists and um, uh, so uh, help me welcome um, uh, Taylor Irvine, Ellie Farin, Farango, Farinango, excuse me uh, for butchering your name, uh, Josue Rivas, and Cynthia Briones. You're, that I hope I didn't leave anyone out. So um, with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to Brian Adams. And he will be the moderator of this incredible panel today. Thank you, Yakoke. Thank you. Hi, can you all hear me? You're all good? <laughs> Hi, it is an incredible panel. <laughs> I love each and every one of the people on this panel very much. Thank you for having us. It's been a real pleasure setting this up with you all. Um, I'm excited for us all to be here. Um, yes, my name is Brian Adams. I am a freelance photographer based in Anchorage, Alaska. 
uh, traditionally denial land, denial land still. <laughs> um, I am a Nupiac. My Nupiac name is Mungnuk. Um, yeah, I've been freelancing in Alaska for 17 years. And about five years ago, I got to connect with, you know, Post Sway and Taylor and all them for, for Indigenous Photograph. And it's been amazing ever since then to have this community. Um, I wanted to start off with a little bit about the backstory or a little bit of an introduction of Indigenous Photograph if you aren't aware of when we started or how we started. But um, the conversation first started with me, for me, with uh, Josue and our co-founder, Daniela Zeltman. There are four, co four, core, co four <laughs> co-founders, and that's Josue, Taylor, Daniela, and myself. And we were at the 2017 National Geographic Photo Seminar, and Daniela put it in my ear that Josue and her had been talking about um, creating something for indigenous peoples in North America. Um, anything that Daniela is a part of, <laughs> I 100% back. Uh, she's been a powerhouse in the photographic community for years now. She had founded uh, Woman Photograph, and I had been a I've had been a huge fan of hers for many years. We have, we first met, I think, she maybe 2016, 2015 at a um, image deconstructed workshop and I knew right away from her presence that I would be happy to work with her on any future projects. But so Josue and Daniela pulled me aside and told me a, a little brief idea of what they wanted to work on and I right away thought it was the smartest thing ever. Um, seeing the idea of Indigenous photographers working together collaboratively and sharing the work and having a stronger voice together. I wanted to be on that boat. Um, Taylor came on with me at right about the same time. And in uh, on May 1st, 2018, we uh, officially launched uh, as Natives Photograph and it was based on indigenous photographers in North America. Uh, we started off very small with about, I think maybe about 20, 25 photographers, maybe. <laughs> and a very tight knit group. But what was great is we got to reach out to all the photographers and storytellers that we love, that we knew were working in, in indigenous communities. Um, all of us as indigenous photographers are very aware of each other's work. <laughs> um, all of, my early career, especially the first 10 years, was me watching um, photographers, typically Caucasian males from New York coming to Alaska, dropping in for three days, going to a village and shooting a story. And, you know, you see this work and you're just like, wow, you really scratched the surface on that because, you know, they, there it wasn't photographers that were in the community, working in the community. And um, I, I knew with this organization, we could really help change that. And it's been great. And it's been really working well <laughs> for us. I'm very proud of this organization. Um, so yeah, we have first launched as Natives Photograph in 2018 and with the help of James Estrin over at the New York Times, the story came out alongside that, which really helped us launch off really very strong. And since then, um, many more organizations and publications have been really amazing to work with and backed what we stand for, what we're doing. Um, in 2021, we relaunched as Indigenous Photograph and it expanded our members from, yeah, about 20 to a little over 70, I believe we're at right now. That means we have amazing indigenous photographers that we know and work with and love to speak to all over the world now. We have, we have members in New Zealand, Ireland, you know, Europe, Canada, Mexico, and the community has really grown and is really thriving together, I believe. 
Um, yeah, and it's been all with a lot of help of a lot of different organizations like this that have helped us, you know, work together to um, let people know that we're out here, we're working in our communities and we love and care about what we're doing. In 2018, we had a great piece come out with Nat Geo, edited by Jennifer Samuel on Native American identity. That was another really great milestone. I just like all the little notes about <laughs> our accomplishments. <laughs> also, in, I think it was 2019, we had a booth at Photoville, um, a, a container at Photoville and a lecture there that really helped spread the word about indigenous, indigenous photograph and just the more people we can reach out to and photo editors we can reach out to that want to go about hiring and working with communities right <laughs> in, a, in the right way, I believe, um, it just makes me happy. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to leave off with. But in, for this year, we have to have a new meeting on um, another meeting on new applicants and all together we'll go through it together and work on new applicants. So if you're an indigenous photographer out there, you'd like to apply, we'll be doing our, we'll be going through app, new applicants very shortly. Uh, I'm really excited to see work because I love, I'm proud of all the work that we do. Um, and so, I like what a lot of lectures I've been attending lately, they haven't had, been showing much work. So I really wanted to showcase and celebrate the work of our members, starting off with Taylor. Thank you, Brian. Uh, <laughs> hi, everyone. <laughs> super happy to be here. Super excited to share some work. Um, like Brian said, my name is Taylor. I'm a photographer from the Flathead Reservation in Northwest Montana. I'm a member of the Confederated Salish. I'm gonna meet you, Brian. There you go. I'm a member of the Salish and Kootenai tribes. Um, we're a small tribe of about 8,000 members. Um, yeah, I'll just share a little bit about who I am and why I got into this work that I do and, and show some images. Uh, let me share my screen. There we go. Um, this is my family. This is my nephew, Antonio. This is my nephew, Andrew, and my niece, Shelby, and that's my dad. Um, and so growing up on the reservation um, in, in media and in the mainstream media, I never really saw um, myself reflected or my family or my friends or my community was never reflected in the media. Um, and I didn't realize like how, how, how much that would affect me until I got older, um, but you know, we weren't on television shows, we weren't on um, movies, we weren't in the newspapers. And if we were, it was always like full of stereotypes and poverty porn and like the Tonto, the romanticized version, powwows, regalia, you know, it never really showed us as people, more as uh, caricatures of people. And I didn't realize how much that affected me until I got to college when I realized that nobody knew what natives were, or who natives were, or anything about my, myself or my culture. And it was just full of ignorance. And um, my dorm floor, I was the only native on the floor. And you know, they asked me if I lived in a teepee, if I, <laughs> if my whole tribe lived in the same house, you know, just full of ignorance that I ride horses to school, all of the things. Um, and it really made me feel othered and we feel like, um, like I didn't belong and really lonely actually. <laughs> and so, I left um, school after a semester and I returned back to the reservation and back home. And um, now that I have time to reflect back on that, I realized it's like all of that stems from ignorance, right? No one's teaching about natives. You don't see them on TV. You don't see them in newspapers. And um, that plays a big part in who I am and why I photograph now. And so I went back home and I started photographing my uh, My name is Dave Marr. I work for the Wilson Center for Humanities and Arts at the University of Georgia. Um, and we are uh, presenting this, um, this conversation today with, uh, with, with some artists from the Indigenous Photograph Collective. Um, we, uh, we are 
really indebted to the Institute uh, for Native American Studies here at the University of Georgia and the Georgia Museum of Art, which are our partners along with Indigenous Photographs in this event. Um, I want to very quickly uh, let you all know that um, that uh, the the panelists are going to talk for a while, and they're they're each going to present uh, some of their work, and then they'll they'll uh, have some questions for each other, perhaps. And and at any time that that you would like in the audience to um, to enter a question for the panel. Uh, or any individual panelist, you're welcome to do that. Um, there's a Q&A feature. Um, so just uh, click on that at the bottom of your screen and you can enter your question. Um, the first person we're gonna hear from is uh, my friend Leanne Howe. Um, Leanne is a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Um, she's a poet an author and a filmmaker, and she's a professor of English here at UGA. And she's also the director of the Institute of, F of um, Native American Studies, sorry. Um, Leanne, welcome. And thank you, for, uh, thank you for being here and thank you for kicking this off. Oh, thank you so much, Dave. I'm, I'm uh, delighted to be here. I want to welcome everyone uh, Halito Chicanas, uh, we are coming to you today uh, from the historic indigenous lands of the Cherokee Nation and the Muscogee Creek Nation. Um, and UGA is situated on those lands, um, and we want to honor them um, in our conversations. You know, the art of sculpting the land in Native America has always been the purview of American Indians. Artists, storytellers, painters, sculptors, writers, and most profoundly, Native and Indigenous photographers. I remember some of the first images I ever had seen of American Indians was at the Wool Rock Museum uh, in Oklahoma. I was probably 10 years old and it made a huge impression on me uh, at the time and I've always returned to that image. Um, um, I was with my grandparents and yes, the photographs were romantic, powwow photographs. Others were from family collections such as Indian cowboys at rodeos and some were of my great great grandfather shoeing a horse. So natives have changed, developed, our art has grown. And for that reason, I'm honored to be sitting on this incredible panel of artists. And um, uh, so uh, help me welcome um, uh, Taylor Irvine, Ellie Farin, Farinango, Farinango, excuse me uh, for butchering your name. Uh, Josue Rivas and Cynthia Briones. You're, that I hope I didn't leave anyone out. So um, with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to Brian Adams and he will be the moderator of this incredible panel today. Thank you, Yakoke. Thank you. Hi, can you all hear me? You're all good. <laughs> Hi, it is an incredible panel. <laughs> I love each and every one of the people on this panel very much. Thank you for having us. It's been a real pleasure setting this up with you all. Um, I'm excited for us all to be here. Um, yes, my name is Brian Adams. I am a freelance photographer based in Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, traditionally, Denial Land, Denial Land still. <laughs> Um, I am Inupiaq. My Inupiaq name is Mungnuk. Um, yeah, I've been freelancing in Alaska for 17 years. And about five years ago, I got to connect with, you know, Josue and Taylor and all of them for, for Indigenous Photograph. And it's been amazing ever since then to have this community. 
Um, I wanted to start off with a little bit about the backstory or a little bit of an introduction of Indigenous Photograph, if you aren't aware of when we started or how we started. But um, the conversation first started with me, for me, with uh, Josue and our co-founder, Daniela Zeltman. There are four, 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 four co-founders, and that's Josue, Taylor, Daniela, and myself. And we were at the 2017 National Geographic Photo Seminar, and Daniela put it in my ear that Josue and her had been talking about um, creating something for indigenous peoples in North America. Um, anything that Daniela is a part of, <laughs> I 100% back. Uh, she's been a powerhouse in the photographic community for years now. She had founded uh, Woman Photograph, and I had been a I've had been a huge fan of hers for many years. We have, we first met, I think, she maybe 2016, 2015 at a um, image deconstructed workshop and I knew right away from her presence that I would be happy to work with her on any future projects. But so Josue and Daniela pulled me aside and told me a, a little brief idea of what they wanted to work on and I right away thought it was the smartest thing ever. Um, seeing the idea of Indigenous photographers working together collaboratively and sharing the work and having a stronger voice together. I wanted to be on that boat. Um, Taylor came on with me at right about the same time. And in uh, on May 1st, 2018, we uh, officially launched uh, as Natives Photograph and it was based on indigenous photographers in North America. Uh, we started off very small with about, I think maybe about 20, 25 photographers, maybe. <laughs> and a very tight knit group. But what was great is we got to reach out to all the photographers and storytellers that we love, that we knew were working in, in indigenous communities. Um, all of us as indigenous photographers are very aware of each other's work. <laughs> um, all of my early career, especially the first 10 years, was me watching um, photographers, typically Caucasian males from New York coming to Alaska, dropping in for three days, going to a village and shooting a story. And, you know, you see this work and you're just like, wow, you really scratched the surface on that because, you know, they, there it wasn't photographers that were in the community, working in the community. And um, I, I knew with this organization, we could really help change that. And it's been great. And it's been really working well <laughs> for us. I'm very proud of this organization. Um, so yeah, we have first launched as Natives Photograph in 2018 and with the help of James Estrin over at the New York Times, the story came out alongside that, which really helped us launch off really very strong. And since then, um, many more organizations and publications have been really amazing to work with and backed what we stand for and what we're doing. Um, in 2021, we relaunched as Indigenous Photograph and it expanded our members from, yeah, about 20 to a little over 70, I believe we're at right now. That means we have amazing indigenous photographers that we know and work with and love to speak to all over the world now. We have, we have members in New Zealand, Ireland, you know, Europe, Canada, Mexico, and the community has really grown and is really thriving together, I believe. Um, yeah, and it's been all with a lot of help of a lot of different organizations like this that have helped us, you know, work together to um, let people know that we're out here, we're working in our communities and we love and care about what we're doing. In 2018, we had a great piece come out with Nat Geo edited by Jennifer Samuel on Native American identity. That was another really great milestone. I just like all the little notes about 
<laughs> our accomplishments. <laughs> also, in, I think it was 2019, we had a booth at Photoville, um, a, a container at Photoville and a lecture there that really helped spread the word about indigenous, indigenous photograph. And just the more people we can reach out to and photo letters we can reach out to that want to go about hiring and working with communities right <laughs> in, a, in the right way that I believe um, it just makes me happy um yeah I think that's pretty much where I wanted to leave off with but in for this year we have to have a new meeting on um, another meeting on new applicants and all together we'll go through it together and work on new applicants so if you're an indigenous photographer out there you'd like to apply we'll be doing our we'll be going through new applicants very shortly uh i'm really excited to see work because i love i'm proud of all the work that we do um and so i like what a lot of lectures i've been attending lately they haven't had, been showing much work so i really wanted to showcase and celebrate the work of our members starting off with taylor Thank you, Brian. Uh, <laughs> hi, everyone. <laughs> super happy to be here. Super excited to share some work. Um, like Brian said, my name is Taylor. I'm a photographer from the Flathead Reservation in Northwest Montana. I'm a member of the Confederated Salish. I'm going to meet you, Brian. There you go. I'm a member of the Salish and Kootenai tribes. Um, we're a small tribe of about 8,000 members. Um, yeah, I'll just share a little bit about who I am and why I got into this work that I do and, and show some images. Uh, let me share my screen. There we go. Um, this is my family. This is my nephew, Antonio. This is my nephew, Andrew, and my niece, Shelby, and that's my dad. Um, and so growing up on the reservation um, in, in media and in, in the mainstream media, I never really saw um, myself reflected or my family or my friends or where my community was never reflected in the media. Um, and I didn't realize like how, how, how much that would affect me until I got older. Um, but you know, we weren't on television shows. We weren't on um, movies. We weren't in the newspapers. And if we were, it was always like full of stereotypes and poverty porn and like the Tonto or the romanticized version, powwows, regalia, you know, it never really showed us as people more as uh, caricatures of people. And I didn't realize how much that affected me until I got to college when I realized that nobody knew what natives were, or who natives were, or anything about my, myself or my culture. And it was just full of ignorance. And um, my dorm floor, I was the only native on the floor. And you know, they asked me if I lived in a teepee, if I, <laughs> if my whole tribe lived in the same house, you know, just full of ignorance that I ride horses to school, all of the things. Um, and it really made me feel othered and we feel like um, like I didn't belong and really lonely actually. <laughs> and so I left um, school after a semester and I returned back to the reservation and back home. And um, now that I have time to reflect back on that, I realized it's like all of that stems from ignorance, right? No one's teaching about natives. You don't see them on TV, you don't see them in newspapers. And um, that plays a big part in who I am and why I photograph now. And so, I went back home and I started photographing my life and what it looked like to be, um, be native where I'm from in Montana. And so this is just a, it's a bitterroot dig. So he's holding a bitterroot, which is one of our traditional food staples. And um, we pick it every year and obviously it's very bitter. So he's, um, he's trying that out and you know, my dad tricked him. And so, you know, right away you have like a stereotype broken. No one is stoic in this photo, right? <laughs> like it's, it's just joy, it's family, it's, um, it's love, right? And then it's moved on to like, you know, photographing powwows, what powwows look like to me. And, you know, um, you think about powwow photos and you think of like regalia and you think about dancing and, you know, it's all very exotic and very beautiful and exciting. And, you know, like Brian said, white photographers love that, <laughs> but that just scratches the surface of what powwow is, especially to me. For me, my powwow on my reservation is the one time my whole family gets together um, for like something happy, aside from funerals and all the other things. 
and I have core memories at this power as a child. And so this is one of the memories is getting my hair braided. And I don't know if any of you guys have your hair braided, but it, it hurts and it's not fun. It takes a long time. And so just that kind of bored moment of, of life is what, what I think is beautiful and what I like to photograph. Um, I, again, the that my nephew work focuses on my family. Um, it's just my experience in life and it, it, it shifts, but it always comes back to my family for me. Um, this is a picture of the medicine tree, another ceremony we have, um, just life. Um, so after did that for a while, this is, this we sweat here, um, it's my nephew. So after photographing and kind of, you know, getting used to my family and photographing whatever means things to me, I wanted to focus more on um, indigenous issues, um, things that affect myself, my community and um, Native America as a whole. And so I started getting into more, um, oops, I started getting into more um, larger projects, I think. And one of the things that affect indigenous communities the most is the missing and murdered indigenous woman crisis, which is a project that I've been working on for, uh, it's a subject I worked on on and off for years now. And native women go missing and are murdered at rates higher than any other ethnicity in this country. Um, and so I'm following that, like what it means and how that happens. And you know, a large part of that is because natives aren't represented in media. Um, when you're not represented, when you people don't know you exist, you can disappear. Right. Um, so my work hopefully helps eradicate part of that and showing, you know, who's missing and what's happening and people who are searching for them. So on the left, this is Kim, her little sister, Ashley Loring, Kevin Renner went missing in 2017 from the Blackfeet Reservation. Um, she has not been found. And this photo was taken um, in the spring um, two years ago because where we live, winter is pretty heavy. And so they can't search in the winter. It's, everything's frozen, you can't see anything. And so when the spring happens, they go on their searches. And this photo was taken after a rumor that the body of her little sister was put in a cave somewhere. And so we went out to this field where there are a lot of underground, underground rivers and we were looking and this is an image I caught from that. And on the right side, this is an activist. Her name is Donna Kipp. Um, she was in high school and this photos were taken and just shows how, um, how the crisis affects her and her family. And you know, she's a high school girl thinking about going missing and she's a boxing club and she's learning how to defend herself. Uh, this was taken this year or last year, I guess now. Um, this little girl is um, tending to her mother's grave. Her mother was murdered in February of 2015, I believe. And um, they never found the murderer and you know, the case is being reopened finally. But you know, it's again, it's like who this, who these affect and you know, these are humans, the people, this little girl who should not be putting <laughs> dirt under her family's grave. And so the work that I'm doing now explores, you know, the aftermath, explores people who go missing, what happens after you go missing and um, just a slice of life that people need to know about. Um, you know, because there's so many, um, this is just one event where people brought all their signs of their missing relatives. Um, I also focus on the legacy of colonialism a lot, um, how colonization has affected and still affects tribes to this day, um, focusing on my tribe specifically with blood quantum. Blood quantum is the measurement of Indian blood that you have. Um, when you're native, you're born with a fraction and then that fraction dictates um, whether or not you can be enrolled in your tribe. It's a colonial system set to eradicate tribes because you can only procreate in the same pool for so long before you run into issues like dating your cousin or there's no suitable people left, which is the point because they wanted to um, eradicate us. And so this is, but I framed it through native love, like how, how this affects who we're allowed to love. And so, these are my siblings. This is my sister, Tiana. This is my brother, Michael. Um, Tiana partnered with a man named Nate. He's a member of our tribe. My brother partnered with a woman named Leah and she's from a different tribe. And so how that kind of affects what their children can and can't do. Um, and this is just high school. <laughs> uh, like I said, we're born with a, a fraction. There's that fraction. Um, and she's enrolled, um, but we're already talking about her kids. Like, will, will her kids be enrolled? Does she have a partner from our tribe to have kids? Um, what that affects is hunting rights, hunting regulations, all those kinds of things. So the work I do, I really hope to push um, push issues in light. I don't know. There's not really a solve, a way to solve blood quantum, but it's just a way to get people talking about it. Um, again, hunting rights. And again, I focus on my family very heavily. Like this is my brother and my father, um, and this is my nephew, Andrew. Um, I also am in a really lucky position where I get to um, we get to pitch stories finally, right? Um, it's taking a long time to get here where people, you know, trust 
trust you and and I am very fortunate that I'm in a position where I can pitch stories and work with editors and they they trust me and they go with it and so this is another um, big event that happened this year um, Chief Earl Operson died from the Blackfeet Nation he was a longest serving tribal official in the country um, and so I documented what that looks like and you know just little pieces of Indian country that are huge for us and that I think need to be seen um, this is you know the kids lining up for the chief um, but what's really important to me too, and I think what is true representation um, is not just being included in native angle stories, right? Like we're not just here to photograph native stories, doing native do native things. I think true representation comes from when we are included in big stories across the board. So this is really important for me last year where there are scenes from America's reopening for the New York Times and getting like a thing about America and including, you know, indigenous people. And again, those are, that's my nephew, and another nephew, <laughs> but, you know, including like what our America looks like and being included in multiple stories and having layers, you know, seeing people, seeing natives outside of the native context in real life is um, where I'm moving forward to with my, my work now. Um, you know, see that in climate change, New York Times again did a big climate change package and, you know, they're including native voices and that's where I think that we get actual true representation is when we have these, um, these images included in an overall image about America. It's not just this little corner of us. And I think that's what I'm so excited about with Indigenous Photograph too, is um, for a long time, it felt like because we weren't connected in the way that we should have been. Um, early in my career, I just felt like a silo. Like I was the only native. I was often the only native in newsrooms, but like I, I didn't have a community to fall back on. And that's what's so important about Indigenous Photograph is we all have each other now. And we're all doing amazing work and it's not just my work being seen in the mainstream media, um, this very narrow window of what Native America looks like in Montana, my part of the country, it's everyone's a collective of voices. And that's also where we get accurate representation is when there is more than one person telling a story. It'd be like, it'd be like someone from, you know, California being responsible for telling all of the United States stories and being like, that's, that's America, that photographer right there. And now we have this collective of indigenous photograph where we all tell our pieces of Native America or indigenous communities and we're able to create a whole picture and to me, that's, I think that's the most amazing thing. That's my favorite part about this and the community we build and it's just, it's my favorite. And that's all I really have today. So I'll bounce it over to Brian again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Taylor. Beautiful work. <laughs> I have questions for you, but I'll save them for later. <laughs> I wanna keep this ball rolling because we have so many amazing photographers to share work. Uh, Ellie, I know you're up next. I hope you're ready for some screen sharing, sharing some work. Can't wait to see it. But I'll save, save those questions for later. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Taylor. That was amazing to see your work. Um, let me just share my screen. Um, can everybody see my screen? OK, I'm going to start my presentation. Um, so my name is Eli Farinango. Uh, I am Quichua Tavalo from the northern part of Ecuador. I am the daughter of Virginia Andrango, Alonso Farinango. And I'm the granddaughter of Mercedes Farinango, Joaquin Perugachi, Virginia Andrango, Cipriana Andrango, and the great granddaughter of Rosa Andrango and Marcelo Arias. Um, and this is a photograph of my grandparents and my mom and my aunts when they lived in Quito. And I wanted to do, introduce myself this way because this is one of the, the photographs that I had um, just lying around. It was like all ripped and weird, and but it was the photograph I had that showed me what my grandparents looked like um, and who they were and like what kind of surroundings they were in. And I took this photograph and I um, recreated it so I could have it. And it's almost like a guiding light for me as to why I do the things that I do. Um, so I was born in Ecuador and my parents migrated to Canada when I was nine years old. And a lot of what Taylor said, you know, resonated. I was often the only Quechua, the only indigenous person wherever I was. Um, and yeah, that was very lonely and it had, you know, a lot of impact as to how I saw myself, you know, it's, it's not easy being like the only one and people just thinking you're weird or making fun of you. My dad kept the long hair, which is something traditional in our community. And I was bullied and just, it wasn't, I didn't have a good time when I was little. And at some point I just kind of wanted, <laughs> wanted to like stop being indigenous, you know? And I had a moment in, in school where I was like, um, 
just with a friend and just like don't tell anyone you're indigenous people will make fun of you so that's where how I kind of grew up and photography for me became kind of this this thing and how I learned to explore the world and like seeing myself and just photographing my family um, and this is a photograph of a faja so in my community women wear fajas or chumbis around our waist um, as a symbol of femininity and as a way of protecting our wombs um, earlier this year I found out that they are also passed on from generation to generation um, as a way of like keeping us close together. And my mom was telling me this story and she brought out my faja from when I was a baby. She had brought it over to Canada with her and I didn't know for most of my life. I just found out this past year. So I took a picture of it because um, for me, photography is kind of my way of creating my own faja, my own link, my own way of keeping this story for my future generations that will grow up here. Um, this is a photograph of the mountain where we're from. And I also wanted to show this because it's it's something interesting, you know, growing up in, in a diaspora and like always feeling this nostalgia for home and really not understanding what home means. Because even when I went back to Ecuador, I really felt like I didn't really belong there either. Um, so through photography, I started creating worlds where I made myself belong. Um, and the first, the first times I approached photography in any kind of serious way um, was in 2017, 18. And I actually heard Taylor, Brian, and Josue talk um, at Photoville. I remember I was like in the car and I was listening to their Instagram live and I was like, my God, it's so cool. Like, it's so cool that they're doing this and sharing these stories. And a lot of what they were saying was really resonating with me. And it really like, you know, it's so important to have representation and not just in like, oh, I see another indigenous person, but in a representation where it's like the story that I've carried in my body or the story that I think like no one cares about or no one else has lived. People have lived and like, we've been processing that collectively, but alone. Um, so this photograph is from a, from a series I did very early on called Healing Through Remembering. And it was me going back to Ecuador after being here for so long and just kind of having like this grand ideas of what healing looks like um, and just like wanting to go and photograph it. And then, you know, talking to my grandma and like really learning about what it meant to, to live under the colonizing uh, the colonizing uh, things, you know, that happened in Ecuador in my territory with the haciendas, with the obrajes. Obrajes are kind of like plantations. I don't know how to translate it, but it was basically like uh, they had a bunch of indigenous people kind of enslaved making textiles. Um, what it meant to, to come from that history. And it was very heavy and I was definitely not prepared <laughs> um, but definitely grateful I had my camera with me to kind of help process this um, so I spent a lot of time with my grandmother learning about spirituality from her and what it what it what it's like to unearth in all of these these feelings and these emotions that come with being an indigenous woman you know an indigenous woman we've had to go through a lot to be able to you know speak to the outside world but also within our community there's still a lot of stuff that happens so through my grandmother, she she shared a lot of her knowledge, especially with, you know, with talking to spirits and being really spiritual. And like, it's it's taken a while for me to embrace that, um, but it is through her labor that I'm able to to carry that. Um, and recently, you know, I've been I've been working a lot on myself and really thinking about what it's like to have um, to have to deal with. The, the Western medical complex when we're approaching for, for support, um, especially when we need support for mental health. Um, earlier in the pandemic, I was diagnosed with uh, borderline personality disorder and depression and, and PTSD and a bunch of other stuff from just my life experiences that, I, that I've had to go through. Um, and I lean on photography to kind of talk about this and pulling on the threads, you know, because I do feel like this intergenerational uh, weight that we carry um, can be healed. And for me, that's that's come through with photography. This is another image that I made um, in when I'm trying to explain, you know, what it feels like to feel depressed. Um, I often refer to the water a lot because my grandmother always, always mentioned, you know, 
like move your waters, move your waters. So that was a way for me to kind of connect to, to her and to that, those teachings. Um, and like Taylor also, I look at my family a lot. There's a photograph of my mom. Um, I started working on this project named Una Causai, um, maybe two, two and a half years ago now. Um, and really inspired by the need to, to say something about my unique experience as being a Quechua of the diaspora and not really feeling like I belonged here or there um, and finding ways in like finding the places where like our culture intersects with our daily lives here in, in North America. Um, and I wanted to, to start with myself and my family before I started with other people because I didn't really know what I was doing and I didn't know how to tell this story. Um, and I really wanted to figure that out on my own first with my family before I expanded outwards. Um, I come from a community that's um, that's really photographed and really studied. The Otavalos are, are well known. We have like a large market, the largest indigenous market. And we have a lot of white photographers, white anthropologists, white sociologists that have studied us and have written about us. And it's, it's exhausting, you know, when you're looking for your history and to see the only things that are out there are like made by people that don't even know about your experience. And then having this intersection of being like part of the diaspora adds another layer that I really wanted to, to learn how to talk about. Um, and while I was doing, while I was doing this, you know, because I, I, I wasn't quarantined with my parents, like things were happening. Um, I got to a point where I was just, I wasn't sure if I should keep going, what I should do. Um, and again, reflecting back on the archive that I have of my great grandparents and thinking about things, you know, that like Josue says a lot, like being future ancestors and like what, what we're gonna leave behind. Um, I go back to the archive and I, I draw strength from that a lot. So there's a photograph of my great grandmother, uh, Abuelita Rosa, always there being outspoken and supporting me and I'm a very spiritual person and I always feel her presence. I feel like I'm always trying to like get something out for her and for me. This is a photograph of my mom and my sister. My younger sister, she's 16 and she's grown up in a different, no, she's 17 now. She's grown up in a very different world than us. Um, and I, for me, it's been always like my dream and my desire for her to carry forward the stuff that my mom taught me and like just have access to things that I didn't have when I was younger, like photography when I was her age. I had no idea that it even was a possibility for me to become a photographer. As a photograph of my dad. So when we migrated, of my dad's band. So when we migrated to Canada, um, we came with a music band. So in my, in my community there's a lot of people that travel outside of Ecuador as uh, merchants or to play music in different streets around the world um, and my dad was kind of part of this wave of migration that came to the U.S. and Canada in the early 90s uh, late 80s and you know they would play on the street corners and you know meet people like that and I really wanted to like tap into this history and kind of uplift it because in the in the books and all these histories that have been written about the Otavalos, the way that they talk about us is almost like, oh, these poor people, you know, they came here and they're doing this. It was kind of like, it wasn't uplifted. So for me, I really wanted to like bring that up and like show people that yes, we were there on the streets, but it comes from like a deeper, a deeper connection to music and just how we we've learned to navigate with our culture to support us. Um, and then that work has, you know, expanded with Runa Kausai and I'm involving uh, other people I'm working with. Kichwa Atari, which is a collective based here in New York of Kichwa artists um, and youth that have been doing work around language re revitalization, around our culture. And together we've been really building this project beautifully. And, you know, going back to this idea of the Faja, um, and the Faja is where our stories would also written through, through textiles and through little symbols and stuff. So right now, like collectively, we're building our faja of what it means to be Kichos of the diaspora. Uh, this is one of my collaborators, Adina Farinango. She is, we're not related, but we have the same last name. Um, and she's a Kichwa artist that has been like 
super, super supportive of Luna Causa and really, and really putting trust in me and to put this story forward, which is, is really beautiful to see. And I'm really, really grateful for that. Um, it's cool to kind of work collectively to build this story, something that hasn't happened in our community. Like I said, we've had so many photographers come in and just kind of like extract, extract, extract and create their own narratives about who we are. So this project for me is really special because it's not only my voice, but it's the voice of so many other people that that have had the similar experience and we want to tell, tell our story. Um, this is a coll collaborative photograph that I'm doing. So this photograph was actually taken by my sister, Daiwa, the girl that you saw in pictures previous. Um, and then I double exposed it with some embroidery from, from our community. Um, and these are the youth that live in Wisconsin. Uh, we've been also engaging with, with the Kitra youth over there in Wisconsin and Chicago to create the story you know, of the Kitra diaspora throughout North America and throughout, yeah, throughout the US and Canada. And there's a picture of my sister and yeah, I think that's that's about it about me and my work and <laughs> who I am as a photographer. I'm gonna stop sharing. Oh, wonderful, Ellie. Thank you so much. Beautiful work. I love those double exposures. Um, and yeah, I loved your note, little note at the end there about extract, 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 because I feel like a lot of the things that we're all on the same page about, especially with this panel, is we all like to we collaborate with our with the people we're photographing instead of just going in and taking and getting out and that's one of the things i love about this panel is everybody on this panel works really works with who they're photographing to tell the stories correctly okay um host way hey buddy <laughs> um <laughs> Um, Piali everyone, my name is Josu Rivas and I am Nahuatl Mexica and Otomi from Mexico. And yeah, um, I'm really excited to share this work with you. Um, it's really interesting when I share this work is, is it comes back to the question of the future being indigenous, but also why, why, why is this work important? Why am I here doing this work, you know? And I think that I check in on that constantly because um, we're living in a very important time in humanity's history where we are most likely going to return back to indigenous ways, and that is, that is my hope. Um, so a little bit about background about this body of work from Standing Rock, um, which, which I, I believe is a, a pivotal moment in, you know, in my practice uh, as an artist, as a speech storyteller, and then also uh, obviously for, you know, the larger um, narrative that, that was Standing Rock and, and how much of an effect that had on humanity. Um, so I lived there for about seven months um, at the Oshatisha coin camp, uh, to be precise. And uh, I, I was there based on, based on intuition, but also very much based on, you know, an invitation from, from um, a medicine person that I work with a lot and who helped me go through, go through a lot of stuff in my healing process. Uh, that is from is Humpapa from Standing Rock. Um, so I got a call to 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 go from LA to Standing Rock and drive for uh, three and a half days with my seven. Oh, well, sorry about that. My seven month old son and my wife, um, and we got there and and we were planning to be there for a week, and I ended up staying for about seven months. And I think that a lot of the work that was made at Standing Rock for me was um, looking back in retrospect. You know, I had to. I had to be away from my family. I had to miss my son's like first steps. And in, in, you know, in retrospect, it is really tough to even look at these images sometimes um, because I know that um, there was so much that was sacrificed on not only on my end, but also on the end of the water protectors and the many communities that are still fighting at this moment for indigenous rights and for protection of the land and water. I think that a lot of the a lot of my practice was shifted definitely at Standing Rock and then be, be after Standing Rock. So I was blessed to be uh, part of a fellowship in, in New York uh, through the Magnum Foundation, which 
allow me to really understand what you know what the purpose of my practice was. Well, why am I doing this? Who am I doing this for? And why do I want to invest my time and energy into documenting these these moments? And the more and more I went through the fellowship, the more and more I realized that a lot of this work it's it's about reflection and it's about seeing each other, but also seeing ourselves. And if we are meant to shift the paradigm of vicious storytelling from a patriarchal to a matriarchal way of telling stories, then we must see ourselves and we must return and, and create new ways of seeing ourselves. So for, for that, um, I ended up kind of like creating this process where we were able to, as indigenous peoples and, and people that I knew, especially young people, to be able to make the image not by having somebody else make the image for us, but us having the, um, the agency to, to make that image. So uh, this process called the Standing Strong uh, process, I guess, um, it's very much rooted in people making their own image and then seeing themselves. And, and, and you literally see yourself. So when we create these, these sessions, um, there's a big screen in front, of, in front of the person, the collaborator, and they have a shutter release, right? So the whole process, they get to see and be part of, but also they get to learn the process. So um, the basics of photo editing to, you know, picking an image to even working with an iPad to, to write these messages that they write on these images. And these images are also meant to a certain degree uh, attempt to reframe the, the history of indigenous imagery, uh, especially in this part of the world where um, we, you know, we constantly go back to the images of like people like Edward S. Curtis or like Aaron Huey, you know, or like, you know, I forgot his name, Nelson, I forgot the last name of that guy, but you know, these images that are like so uplifted in, in society, yeah, they don't represent uh, the voices of indigenous peoples and then also the, the process was one where we were shooting and capturing and taking. Um, so this project aims to reframe that process, reframe the narrative, and then also to send the message to the future so that the collaborators are able to write something that, you know, when they're old, they're able to share to their grandkids, like, this is who I was at that moment in my life. And this is a message that I had for, for y'all, you know, for, for the future. And then even beyond that, when we pass on in a hundred years, if there is a Google, you know, when <laughs> the first images that, that pop on are not images of you know, indigenous peoples from like 500 years ago, but, you know, of, of now, you know, how we see ourselves. So that is a very important part of the process is, is making for now and then also thinking of how this work is going to live through generations. Um, and in 2020, obviously, was an extremely big year for my practice and in and, uh, a personal level, um, a lot shifted. Uh, and, you know, I live in Portland, Oregon. Um, and a lot of stuff was happening here locally and also just in general, you know, just that the, the larger energy that was that was hunting our, our spirits, really, in my opinion, um, of of protest and pandemic. So um, when I when I started going out to, to the protests here, they actually happening down the street from my house. Um, I didn't really bring my camera. I, I was very hesitant to go out there and document because as soon as I show up there, there was so many amazing like black photographers that were just they were this was their moment to, to really tell this story and so I would show up and, and talk to folks help out um, not being a you know quote unquote like photojournalist but rather being a human that they really care about this moment um, but then they, and then eventually <laughs> We started getting into into some some of the movement that folks were like, "Hey, we, we need to have, you know, videography, photography, design," and and I offered to 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 give my services, I guess, or to like document, you know. And I said, "Well, what is it that you need? Um, what you know?" So a lot of these images that we I was making, um, I was bringing back the following day as as posters, right? So this image became a poster, and. And it was very much about just being useful. Like, how can we make sure that the image is a useful tool, not a tool what that is there to extract or to um, perpetuate uh, trauma and, and, and violence towards, especially in this case, our, our Black brothers and sisters. Um, so in that same energy, 
I started connecting with the local native community because the native community was very much in solidarity with this movement here in Portland where they will show up to the protest. And in, in, that, in, that, um, in those moments, I met uh, Amber who is uh, Afro-Indigenous. She, she is uh, uh, Muskogee Cree and also uh, African-American. And um, it was a really interesting moment of, of as all these things were happening, we were like, we, should, we need to collaborate on something. And um, one day the statue of George Washington came down in Portland and and she, she you know, we were just chatting and she's like, we should go there and, and kind of like do something with that. So we did, it was, it was very much a, a you know, with, with much the space, we, we were kind of like, what, what should we do here? And she was like, I want to, I want to be on top of it. I want to be able to, to create something that, that is for me, you know, I need to be able to, to do that. So back and forth, we collaborated and came up with this image on the left and like a few weeks after, we, I was like, we need to we need to put this image up somewhere. So I, I connected with a creative agency here in Portland, and we were able to put the image up on their building, uh, which is on the right side. Sorry. Um, and this image, I always just you know just like to show it because um, during this time as well, I was thinking a lot about and and really reflecting on on the you know the, not only the Redskins as as or. You know, unfortunately, that's the name that they had. The, now the the commanders. Um, but what what does that mean for for not only indigenous folks here in or in Canada or even in Mexico and like South America and and you know, all these like stereotypes, right? All these um, these ideas that we have of indigenous people because our reality has been shaped by others and not by ourselves. So I decided to burn a lot of this merch that that I was getting and, and photograph it and and almost like see it in as a as a rebirth, right, of what hopefully can be. Um, and in this same time, I, I was, you know, the pandemic hit everyone and, and we weren't able to go out and, and document sometimes. So I started wondering how can I make images from my, from my, you know, from my own little living room? How can I connect with people and continue a conversation that is collaborative and intentional um, and in the, this time it was very important for me to to stay in touch with people and, and check in because on a personal level I was having a really hard time and, and I know a lot of people were also having a really hard time so um, these images this this project was made uh, via FaceTime so we would have these photo sessions on FaceTime and you know people were obviously very safe and some of them were outside some of them were in their own homes um, and it was a, a way of us collaborating on something together that could give us a snapshot or, or where their life was at that moment. And it was important for me to also understand that the way that technology will continue to, to, to shift the way we see the world and especially how we see indigenous peoples that if we are capable and which we truly are of mastering this um, not even mastering, but rather like being part of the conversation of how technology is shaped, then we will be able to hopefully tell stories with intention and ask collaboration. Um, and I'll leave with, I'll also leave it with this, is that I think that the future of visual storytelling, which already have seen so much in the last few years, but especially in the future, is going to be collaboration. I think that we're hopefully will stop feeding the idea of the lone wolf or the, you know, the one photographer that gets a one iconic image and rather starts expanding and falling into a place where we can co-create with people and hopefully regenerate instead of extract. And the last thing is that as, as I was continuing to, to learn a lot of these different ways of making images in the last year, you know, as, 2020 showed us that, you know, whenever, whenever there's a, um, you know, something that happens to a community or some form of trauma that, that we, for example, in 2020 with George Floyd, you know, a lot of the times people, especially brands, especially corporations are attempting to not look like they are racist or they are anti-Black. And I think that that, you know, through seeing that experience, I saw a little bit of the future where I think that we're waiting for the tragedy to happen to indigenous peoples for us to care. You know, we're, 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 we're not very proactive on the way that we make images and tell stories, especially with these corporations that are constantly, you know, feeding 
of community. Um, so with that being said is we are constantly thinking about how we can create not even just protocols, but create a paradigm where before the tragedy happens, we already are implementing ways of working with these brands that are constantly reaching out to people and, and really not taking care of them. Um, so we are, um, it's called Indigena and it's a very small idea at this point, but um, we are being that, that middle person, that consultant that creates images in this case with Levi's um, and, and we bring an indigenous crew, right? And we bring, you know, some of the values of the way that we live our lives, hopefully into the production space. You know, we, we bring the local folks, in this case, the Gabrielino Sashoni tribe in Los Angeles, um, we brought them on to, to welcome us to, to be able to work on their space and to be able to co-create with them. And we incorporate them into the story. So I think that the future of humanity is indigenous, but the future of storytelling is also indigenous. And, and as, you know, they're not separate from each other. And I think that that's kind of where indigenous photographs, especially a lot of these photographers that are working in their communities are going to be um, so vital for, for the way that we see ourselves. Uh, Kamati, thank you. And yeah, to pass it on to you, Brian. Thank you, Jose. Beautiful work. I love how big you think. I love how you're not only thinking just on photojournalism, the photojournalism side of you, but also on the advertising and working with the campaigns on trying to have more representation in advertising too. I just love how big you're thinking. And I also love how you think of even about you wanting your work living for generations. I think that's beautiful. And it's something that we all grew up not having and that we're all working towards and it makes me very proud. Great work, brother. Okay, Cynthia, let's see where are we at. Okay, Cynthia, rock and roll, you're all set. Oh, good, thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Cynthia. I'm from Mexico, but my paternal family is uh, Nahuas from the La Sierra Norte de Puebla, the north of Puebla, uh, from a town called Pahuatlán. Um, I'm going to present um, two projects that I have been working. Um, let me see, I can put play um, here. Um, one is the migration codex. Like a long time ago, um, I, I studied anthropology when I was in Mexico and I was focusing my dissertation on indigenous migration. Um, I was working in an indigenous community um, in Veracruz, um, uh, Ayotuxla, and in that period of time, most of the men used to come to New York City to work in restaurants, uh, living in Flushing, in Corona, in Astoria. So in that time, um, I, I was like doing research about indigenous migration, reading a lot of literature about it, um, was not so much like now. Um, and also this period is important because most of the time the people speak about, uh, if you are from Mexico, Latin America, like Latino immigration, and, and now more people are speaking, like we are, we are more, the migration is more diverse, it's not homogenic. So uh, that, you know, like after like the dissertation, I moved to New York and I studied photography. So I was trying to create a project, but at that time I didn't know how to do it. So I was like really involved in the community level, uh, working with indigenous migrants uh, from different parts of Mexico, like from Oaxaca, from uh, La Montaña de Guerrero, and from the region that I, I used to live. Um, and, and I just start photographing them. And, 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 you know, like since 2019, I was thinking about the Tlaquilos that were the person in the pre-Hispanic epoch who were painting the codex, um, the, the books, the antiques books where the pre-Columbians indigenous used to write their history. So I was trying to, to find through codex the, the semiotic and visual links between the migrants from now that are living in New York City, from Mixtecos or Mepa or Nahuas, 
o eh, Tepeguas o Tonalcos and the, the links in, in the codex. So this is the, the Huejotzingo dancers uh, from Puebla. And you can see that uh, one of the dancers is carry on the coyote. So the, the drawings are the, the, the coyotes that extracts um, part of the drawings are from the Codice Borgia. That is a colonial codex, but still with the Tlaquilo, the pre-Hispanic tradition. Um, also part of this work for me is like to compelling um, or archiving the diversity of language. Uh, that is a huge part. Um, so, and, and thinking also like uh, Josue was saying in the future, you know, in, in, in 15 years, somebody is going to maybe review this archive and, and think about that the mistake was speaking in, 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 in New York, like Quichua or, or Mepa, or Nahua, or Totonaco, or, or Tusabi, that is Misteco. So I have been like also doing participatory portraits with friends and I, I do like uh, open interviews, but also working in a workshop um, format to, to collect all this information. So the people write about the migration experience, but also about the traditions, um, the, the, their culture, uh, how they are, their towns, they are doing like maps or their towns. So, and also we, we I, you are going to listen the, the the sound of the language. Can you hear? Yushika, This is Mistek. You can see here the, you can follow the, the pronunciation. Llévete con intiadí, anime vi con inantoa. So, um, this is a friend, Lucio, um, and most of the portrait that I have been doing, I start with friends that I know for a long time ago, and he is part of the Mexica group dance at the and Campan, and also I do I did with his portrait uh, collage. Uh, this is also one of the uh, folios or, or pages of the Borgia Codes. That is a codex about rituals. It's a calendar also. Um, so you can see also the similitudes, uh, the feathers, the dress, um, and this one are the Tequanes dance. That is a big dance uh, that is all over the United States, but here in New York is really huge because a lot of the indigenous migrants from, come from the Mixteca region between Puebla, uh, Guerrero, and Oaxaca. So also I took like some symbols uh, of the Jaguar in the Borgia Codex to compare the, and to put, you know, to, to give density, historical density to the migration. And also speak in another lens because most of these people work as a deliveries, uh, as a nannies, as a cashiers in, in a factory. So how can we speak in another way about indigenous migration? So he's another friend, he's Lucio and the, the this um, the other photograph is uh, a, a page of the uh, Codice Ramirez Tobar, uh, and you can see also the dancers uh, uh, playing the teponastle and the drums, and he's holding like a, a caracol, a shield, uh, and his feathers. Um, and you know, and in some of the workshops we make collage like this one, and they write in in their language. Um, he is a friend, and he is like a Quiche from uh, Guatemala. And if you can see in the back of the photos and the paper, I have been using um, ensemble the the photos and, and and their text with amate that is a pre-Hispanic uh, paper that is made in the hometown of my grandparents. Um, so this is first generation, something that I also uh, think about and is resonated with all of the, the work that you have been doing is first generation. What is happening with the first generation? Uh, because when you um, have to sign a document, the people ask you Latino heritage or Hispanic heritage uh, or Mexican American or Equatorian American, and I ask this for generation, how identify yourself as a Mixteco American, as a Mepa American, or as a Mepa New Yorkan American? And so I have been also like working with children about this question through workshops, through interviews, 
Um, this is one of the dancers of the Tequanes, one of the, I don't know how to say in English, the, the Cuadrillas. It's a different group of, of Tequanes in, in New York City. Uh, this is Denise, is a, a child from, from Queens, uh, but her parents uh, speak Nahuatl and they are Nahuas from Tlaxcala. Uh, and we made this, I, I, I bring like codex and, and they cut it and they do like the collage and we speak about this, you know, like uh, identity and culture and their past and territory. This is a friend, Prospero, and he speaks Mije and Kiss Mije uh, from Oaxaca. You are going to hear also. Prospero Martinez, I'm in Zeven Shangush, I you how you told. But so nice duck, my how Tiki Nueva York, my how you churn the Tian and Nida, my how you look. It's a shame what cook shall go about, you leave mine out of Madod and I you look Madod. Just go. So also in, in the pandemic, I was really involved in a church, uh, in a mutual aid uh, group. So I met different people and one of them was Doña Josefina and she's now one from Guerrero. And I was like asking her through an interview to cry about her own experience to be volunteer delivering food for people that need it around the neighborhood in Brooklyn. So this also, this portrait we made it in collaboration. Re <laughs> So this is uh, Victorino uh, Guzman and um, his brother died um, in the Bronx. Uh, he was a delivery and he, meanwhile, he was working on his bike. Uh, he got crashed uh, by a car. So um, uh, his brother made like different protests um, to ask for justice for his brother. So this photo was taken in his home. He's holding a victorious um, portrait. And in the middle, the photo is some like um, um, writing in the protest in, in, in Mepa, that is his language also is called uh, Tlapaneco. And in the uh, right side is a letter that uh, Victorio write to his brother. Also like about um, how this project um, focus a lot in migration, you know, like the experience like being a delivery or, or working as a nanny, you know, I, I try to collect um, information that they can share also and, and to, to try to understand in another way migration, like, like the tension for me, like I am working with a friend uh, through this project, in, in another project, uh, she is a uh, Tusavi Mixteca and she works as an interpreter in the course in, in, um, in detention center in US. So now uh, more institutions and organizations like Cielo that is based in Los Angeles are working with indigenous interpreters to, to work in, in the courts because a lot of the, the uh, migrants who come from Guatemala, Mexico, and also from Ecuador, they don't speak Spanish really well is not their first language. Their first language is uh, a native language. So it's like, it's really important to, 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 to you know, to speak aloud about the, 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 the diversity, the linguistic diversity in the migration. So this is the testimony of uh, Juanita that she was in detention center in Texas and she grew her experience in, in Quiche. And we made this, um, this photo collage in collaboration and some of the parts 
are extracts for a codex called Buturini, that is a, a codex that speaks about the, the migration from the Aztec to from Aztlan to Mexico Tenochtitlan. So it's a it's a codex that speaks about my uh, pre-Hispanic migrations. Uh, this is another drawing and, and testimony writing in Spanish and in Man about um, you know also like their their way to from Guatemala to the U.S. and Sorry, this song is called the Xochipil Sawa and is really traditional for uh, Dia de Muertos, the Day of the Dead, but also for Carnival. And, and the wind band is um, the members, most of them are Otomis and Tepehuas uh, from Veracruz, the, the region where I was living and making my dissertation. And as I say, for me, language is really important. So I have compelling like a lot of vocabulary in different language. This is in Mixteco from the region of uh, Puebla and also recreating this collage from taking from uh, different codex. And now I am like also trying to, to ask uh, my collaborators to bring into the workshop on the interviews uh, photos that they have from their relatives, their parents, and sometimes they have, we can, we recreate at some point the image. This is Paulina, that is uh, in the left. Um, and I met her doing another project. So her mother speak Nahua from Tengistengo, Puebla. And she understand Nahua, she doesn't speak Paulina. And the, the, the first generation now, uh, her granddaughter is trying to, you know, identify herself as an Awa American and trying to learn more about her heritage and culture and language. So now I'm going to speak about um, the other project that I have been working is about herbs. And in 2019, I started doing um, cyanotypes, experimenting with herbs that have been immigrated with us and we can find in the Mexican and Guatemalan stores. And um, so I was like also making cyanotides in, in fabric and embroidery. So this work my, that is personal, but also community, um, this is part of an exhibition that now I have. I also make like an accordion, a herbolario, um, and to explain like different kind of herbs and, and uses. Um, and, and another part of this work is to, to do um, the spiritual part of the herbs, um, not just like for healing, you know, the, the, the spiritual cosmovision around herbs and the hometown of my grandparents is this um, tradition of coding papers. And basically the papers, um, uh, the symbols of the paper, different kind of papers that the people cut, this is the mother earth. And the papers are uh, the spirits of the plants. For example, this is the spirit of the chile. So I am doing also cyanotize on fabric and embroider and you know, extending the volario with this part of, of, of a spirituality about the earth. So um, this project is, this is the, the workshop that I have been doing in collaboration with an organization called Mixteca that are based in Sunset Park here in Brooklyn and they were in the intersection of migration and health. So the women who come to the workshop, they learn how to do cyanotides. We create um, a, a acts of listening. So the woman um, bring sometimes uh, the plants or sometimes I also bring uh, plants, but also seeds and barks and minerals. And we speak about memory, about uh, the, the knowledge that we know about these herbs. And they write uh, about um, the herbs, you know, the, 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 the ruda or the, the theme or the pasote. And, 
and they create like this this body of water from them and also they they embroider so this is part of their their work this is not my work so um I have been doing this embroidery part with a collaboration of my friend uh, Maria Jose that is mystic and she leads the part of embroidery this is lavender um, and in the last workshop that we had, we have been doing like five different workshops. We got an exhibition, a pop-up exhibition. So the woman got um, their work um, in a gallery. They also, I am teaching them uh, about these spirits of the plants. So they, they cut the papers and they do these cyanotypes. Um, and I can, this is all. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Cynthia. Stunning work. I love the multimedia work with the images. It's such a great collaboration. And all the artwork is so beautiful and oh, yeah, super exciting. Curious, where do you get where do you get a lot of the artwork to accompany your images? Sorry, say that again. Where do you get a lot of the artwork to accompany your images? Uh, the codex. Yes. I, I have some of them in facsimile edition. So I scan it. And also I, I you know, I study ethnohistory as a bachelor in Mexico that focus in, in codex. So I have like a lot of materials from the past. So I, I print it and I cut it and I use it. Or sometimes I work on, on, the, on the computer on Photoshop. Okay, thank you. So I think at this time we're gonna hang around for some questions. If anybody had any questions, um, Josue had to had to dip out, we had to leave. But um, any questions you'd like to be forwarded to him, we can. I'm sure we can figure out a way to work that out. Also on indigenousphotograph.com, all of our portfolios are right there, ready to go. So if you had any follow up questions for anybody, really easy to get a hold of us. We make it really easy. <laughs> Let's see where we at. I got the chat open, so if anybody's got anything, Brian's cat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is Norris. <laughs> this is Norris. <laughs> oh, yeah. If anybody's got any questions, one of my questions was for you. All, well, for all of you, because I know it means something to me and it means something up here in Alaska that I really appreciate and learned really quickly is when you're working in indigenous communities, like how do you, how do you feel with, like when you're working within your indigenous community, um, how does it make your subjects and the people you're collaborating with feel that they actually have somebody um, that grew up in the community and like, um, lives in the community, helping to tell their stories. Uh, Taylor? Hi. Yeah. Um, so I work mostly a lot in Montana for the tribal communities here. Um, I think generally when they know I'm from here and I'm from the Flatheads, that they get pretty... Um, I think relieved a little bit. I think they have like a sense of trust, which is um, great. Also a little, you know, makes it hold me to higher, a higher standard to, to do better by them. And, you know, it's also a lot easier now because if they don't like the photos or something happened with the reporter or something, then they have like a direct line to someone that they can either like talk to or yell at or, or whatever. And so I think for, for the work that I do, it helps me be a better journalist and it helps them have more trust in me. And I think I hold that relationship to, to a higher standard than someone who's maybe not from the community. And we got a follow up to that. Sure, yes. Yeah, I think the trust thing is something that really comes through, right? And like Taylor said, it's also like our responsibility. Um, but it's also like, I feel like an opportunity for, for me anyways to to kind of show that um, it can be done in a different way. Um, like I know that when people work in, in our community, it's almost like they push to get have more access to go into homes and like do things that 
perhaps people are uncomfortable with or like poses that people aren't comfortable with. Um, and there's that trust, I think, between my collaborators and I to be like, I don't feel like that. And I completely understand, you know, and I'm not going to push them. And there's that trust to say no, uh, which I think it's practice for for many other <laughs> other places for all of us to learn to say no. Yeah. Cynthia. <laughs> The same, I think trusting and spend time with the people and I think camera is really violent and just the idea, you know, the, related with the colonialism and, and also the idea that you take a photo and the people that uh, allow you to photograph, that you photographing them, they don't, they don't um, uh, own the photograph, their own photograph. And for me, it's like give them back the photos uh, and also, um, yeah, collaboration. And so most of the time I work with people that I spend time with them and that give you another kind of sense of what you are doing because I, I don't work as a photojournalist. So it's different. And I think I have been doing assignments a long time ago and it's different the, the feeling and the relation that you build with, with the people that you are in collaborating so basically yeah i hear you um when i when i was first starting off in photography i spent a lot of time doing street portraits and it was really easy for me because i didn't you know it was, it was a nice quick conversation and a photo but if I felt like if I messed it up, it wasn't a big deal. <laughs> and then as I got older and working in more Inuit communities here, um, you know, it's like photographing family. And a lot of these people are relatives <laughs> and having that little extra push to do it right and give a story justice meant a lot. And it also was really interesting because, you know, when I first started traveling in North, Northwestern Alaska, um, you know, the funniest thing would be when you go up to somebody and introduce yourself, tell them what you're working on. And they're like, wait, what's your name? Oh, you're my, you're my, <laughs> you're my cousin. <laughs> I don't know. I love it. I, I love everything about work that. We have this, yeah. yeah, we have the saying in our community is like, whenever we meet someone, immediately ask like, hijito de quien es, which means like, whose daughter or son are you? Like, who is, who is your family member? Whose family do you come from? Yeah. And kind of that, you know, cause like older people say that to each other or to us, but now we kind of get it. And it's like, okay, it's cool. It's like, okay, I know that. Oh, we're related. Like we know each other, like somehow down the line we're connected. I think it just, for us as migrants it just builds that sense of like, cool. Like our community is still kind of tied even though we're so far away from our territories over here. Absolutely. So I'm not, I'm on the chat. I'm not seeing too many questions over here or any. <laughs> so um, Leanne, uh, anything on your end you'd like to add before we wrap it up here? Oh, I've so enjoyed this, this panel. I mean, you all were just awesome. Um, I took a lot of notes, um, things I want to think about um that i can take away from your art and your experiences uh really gave me hope i wanted to say that so many of the things you were commenting on um were part of my uh early years and it, i don't know how to feel about that um what i mean is the the fact that people maybe don't don't know your your tribes or your communities when you're outside of your community. Let's say the way I grew up, and I grew up not far. I grew up in Oklahoma, so very close to my uh, community. But people would still say, "Oh, I thought you were all dead." And some of the cruelest things to get used to um, were comments like that when I was a young person. So I. Um, I, your, your, your panel really resonated with me and I'm so grateful that you took the time and um, told us your stories. That's so important. And um, so again, uh, I can just say, Yakoke Chicana, 
Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Thanks for having us. It's been a great, great panel, great honor. It's all of you. Happy to see all the new work too.